Nema Clymans. I'm the Assistant Director of the Middle East Studies Center at Ohio State University. And this is the Keys to Understanding the Middle East podcast. And I have a very special guest today, Nick Kennard. Um, and uh, I'm just going to ask, uh, ask you, Nick, if you could introduce yourself to the audience. Well, first, uh, Melinda, I'd like to thank you, Joy McCorson, the Middle East Study Center, for inviting me. I've never really been in this particular center, and uh, it's a great pleasure and a privilege, and I uh, look forward to having the conversation with you. Who am I? I'm, first of all, from Ohio, so that's kind of nice. I'm uh, from Cincinnati, grew up in Dayton, living in Yellow Springs at the moment with my family, and just, <clears throat> but I work in Germany, and I've worked in Germany for a long time, and I started doing archaeology in Ohio in, in junior high. I've been an archaeologist for a very long time, and always studied a lot of different things, geology, physics, chemistry, but I always went back to archaeology because it was by far the most fun and most interesting for a whole range of reasons we may touch upon. And uh, I, after getting studied in Rochester, got the master's and PhD at Yale and taught at the University of Connecticut. And since 1995, I've been the head of the Department of Early Prehistory and Quaternary Ecology at the University of Tübingen and also the director of a museum on early prehistory. And so my focus oh, okay. is about archeology, span human evolution. And I would say my research is, I guess to say it's close to global is probably correct. I have a lot of excavations in, in Europe, uh, in East Africa, South Africa. I just got back from Tanzania literally just a couple of days ago from oh, field work. Okay. And I've worked a lot in the, um, the Middle East and just a lot of places. I'm most most of my field work in the Middle East has been in Syria up until the Civil War and and quite a bit in in Iran as well. So those might be topics we want to talk about. Also, you know, I'm very excited to hear about any you know any accounts of digs in Syria or Iran and uh, you know maybe get a little bit insight of insight into the field of archaeology as well. Yeah. Um, this is a really wide audience, you know. Um, so we're going to maybe define a couple terms as we go. But um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your experience. Oh, no, no problem. What, what I always think is interesting is, well, I always wanted to study archaeology. I, I, I work in archaeology, do research in archaeology, because I thought that what I do is really paleoethnology. But, but I'm studying dead and extinct people just because I wanted the political aspects of my work not to be so central. And if you're living, if you're studying living people, it's always super political, right? You can't separate them at all. And most people today would say, even in archaeology, you can't just say, oh, I'm not going to get involved in politics. But if you're studying living people, you're automatically super involved. And the, uh, and obviously any place in the Middle East, the, those are super important aspects of the work going on. But uh, yeah, well, let me know what you want to know. I'll uh, tell you what I was going to say is I almost certainly spend more time in places nobody goes to, including researchers. So I would say just by doing what I'm doing in the places I'm doing it, I have a lot of exposure to all kinds of what I think would normally be considered cultural anthropology, because I'm living in very unusual places where Nobody. You're even, immersed in culture. Uh, You're immersed uh, in local culture. You don't have the freedom to, you know, go to a cafe and speak English or, you know, kind of escape local culture. Nor would I want to. That's just part of the fun okay. of being there. Okay. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, whereas other people would go to Loristan or Kurdistan or wherever, or the anti Lebanon to study the people, at least the anthropologists would, I'm there doing the archeology span and sort of a side effect is I'm heavily engaged with the people because I'm living with them. All of everything I do is with the local people because they're often working on the workforce, obviously food, drink, housing, everything is closely related to that. And most of the places I spend time, if it's in, if it's in Iran, Farsi is the main language. If it's in mm -hmm. Syria, Arabic is the main language. And how all that stuff articulates, then there's always the, a lot of archaeology is happening in very rural places, to say the least, some 
barely inhabited places, yet it articulates with the, let's say, power structure to, uh, stru structure within heritage and museums. A lot of stuff we find go directly into the national museums and mm -hmm. their exhibits and all how all that stuff comes together is super interesting. Yeah, um, that comes to something I really uh, care about when it comes to cross-cultural um, any kind of field work or even just any kind of communication, like how do you build trust when you're in those places? I, I could be naive about things, but I, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about all kinds of places, right? I just got back from Tanzania. People would think, oh, maybe working on Lake Iassi in the middle of nowhere would be somehow complicated. But in fact, when you're there, everything's completely cool, right? Nobody cares. I mean, in my experience, whether you're you know, maybe if you just see somebody from afar, maybe somebody cares. If, I'm, I'm a big white guy, but when you're on the ground, my experience is nobody really cares if you're black, white, or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, if I can't speak Farsi well, say, well, who's this guy with the lousy Farsi? But that's kind of a practical matter. And what, what I think some people, I think partly because of the politics and cultural background of people in the States, where most people don't really know anything about places like Iran or Syria, and very few people have been to the, these kinds of places, I think there might be naively uh, this, I also forgot to mention I work quite a bit in the United Arab Emirates, but um, okay. but yeah. the um, there's this might be this sort of latent idea that, you know, that the personal playing fields are somehow complicated or contentious or or something like that. My experience is the exact opposite. The, the, the people in that I work with in Iran and Syria also in the Emirates, they're extremely loyal people, super loyal, right? The yeah. I it's I would say my experience on average is that I will be respected for my science and my individuality greater in those places than in our, than in our society, right? I think that I always, with very, I, mean, I can't think of any exceptions, go to a place, you know, in Iran, Syria, wherever, and I mean, sometimes they're there. What do you attribute that to? I think it's the, I well, if you go visit a Bedouin group, their culture is generous toward outsiders, right? Mm -hmm. Because they mm -hmm. know if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you need a cup of tea and you need to, potentially a place to sleep and people treat you with respect and kindness. And I, it's not that much different in Ohio. You know, somebody who looks okay knocks on your door and says, hey, I'm a little confused, need a little hand. Probably in Ohio, most places, some people would be nice to you. Um, the But I would say there, uh, my experience is extremely favorable. And also, the there's it, it's not as if people who have more are more generous, right? Mm -hmm. We could be out in the middle of nowhere with nomads or really farmers who are living in a very modest way, but they, if you're staying for dinner, they will kill their chicken. They will give you a good meal and show generosity that is beyond what we would typically show in our society. For I think there might be cultural reasons and historical reasons for that, but the, in general, I would say the level of hospitality in all the places I've worked in the Middle East is extremely high. I would say in general, higher than in the United States of America. Yeah, yeah, it's that makes sense to me too. It's some, yeah, what I've experienced. I guess what I um, would like to know more about is I mean, you did mention politics and um, heritage, you know, is something connected with identity. Sure. You know, it's something um, that can be very, um, that can almost shape a national identity or, you know, have some you know, contribute to it. It can become a symbol of national identity. It has a lot of, um, a lot of different uh, meanings to it. And, you know, no doubt it's, it is very meaningful to people. And um, at the same time, antiquities and treasures and um, artifacts have been, you know, taken from countries and put in museums without really asking permission and things like that. So there is kind of some baggage there too, where people may not trust mm -hmm. you based on not so much like a cultural proclivity or anything like that. But, you know, I mean, have you ever had to really, you know, say, say, look, I, I'm, you know, I, I kind of, you know, 
it, like uh, reassure people that you have um, you're going to be transparent about those things and, and all that stuff. I would say in my experience that it hasn't been a problem. I w that might what might play a role is I work in the Stone Age where the things I'm studying in general, unless it's an ancient artwork or maybe human remains or certain kinds of artifacts, they have no e no economic value. My colleague in Tubing and Peter Fetzner, he's you know he's excavating the burial chamber in Katna where there's gold and all this other stuff, and that becomes a much more sensitive issue. But the kinds of stuff I do is really not strongly connected to any kind of market uh, market concerns. And I would say, and this could be slightly controversial, that in my experience, with the kinds of collections I have and work on and that we have at our institute, that in some cases, people are very happy that they're there because there are so many collections that aren't cared for properly in the country, right? So it's, it's I think, I think there is a tendency the further, the less you know about the topic, the more likely it is that people will generalize and say, oh, you know, the colonial past is only bad, you know, whether it's the Elgin mm -hmm. marbles or Pergamon altar, or whatever it happens to be in uh, the, if you're in a place like Egypt or Syria, or Iran, there is, the heritage is so rich that in many cases, it's extremely difficult, difficult to care for. Right. And managing the heritage in a country so rich in material heritage is a huge challenge. And I think that in many ways, as long as there's mutual respect, there's a there's a pretty broad corridor for finding a way to move forward. It is true that I always take a long term approach to work. I started working in the 90s in Syria, stayed until the war made it impossible in Iran. I've worked there pretty much every year since 2004. I'll be going there in a, yeah, the, well, September, it's end of August now. And there, it's very much a long-term commitment and the people, we, the people know me. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, the trust is there. And I can say that from my own experience, I know of my professor, uh, Frank Hole, he's, he's still alive. He's, I think he's in his early nineties now the fact that I'm his professor, he is enormously respected, especially in Iran, and or Hans-Peter Erdmann, a close colleague of mine in Tumin who works in the Emirates, he's incredibly respected. And uh, the same applies in Syria in different contexts. These, I think the further you away from the reality on the ground, the more contentious those things appear to be. And I also think there's a lot of... Um, you know, rich liberal guilt involved, right? And they're, you know, it's like the Native Americans. The Native Americans, okay, sure. It's nice to give the Native Americans back their skeletal material and some artifacts. But if we were serious about helping the Native Americans, we would give them back their land and their resources. And that's what's not happening. Yeah. So I think a lot of the discussions on heritage are kind of a band-aid or something. It's it's always it's yeah. almost a distraction from the real social economic issues of actual empowerment, right? Heritage is cheap at the end of the day in terms of wealth, education, mm -hmm. finances, and rather than addressing the serious asymmetries in those areas, sometimes heritage is uh, is a distraction from the more serious issues of empowerment, economic equality, education, and things that go beyond whether this object, which may or may not be important, is displayed here or housed there. That's my experience. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you have to take it kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and context matters as well, you know, in terms of what is the artifact and in what place and what it means to the local history there. And, yeah. you know, if that history has been intentionally erased for the reasons of stealing land, then yeah. it'll matter a lot more, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I work a lot in South Africa. The situation in South Africa is very different than in Tanzania. And yeah, I just got back from Tanzania. We talk about this, these things all the time. And the let's say there's one example of uh, German archaeologists who were working in Tanzania in the 30s, and they're highly admired because it's the beginnings of the field. And when the topic comes up, well, were, were they horrible uh, colonial 
you know, people abusing people, the Tanzanians know it's kind of that they have a very positive reputa reputation. I was visiting a professor at the University of Dar es Salaam discussing these things on a daily basis in the field with about 45 students or 65 of us all in the camp together. And those issues are not, they have to be contextualized. And I think they're often not contextualized. I always, I always think of, uh, you know, the, all of these ra racial political uh, aspects are complicated and have to be contextualized. I actually have students, right? Germany's a little different than here, but not, not so different. And I, the student in Germany actually said to a, we had a guest speaker from Uganda and the person, the German student, it could have been an American student, actually said, well, what's it like, you know, with racism, you know, being a woman of color, you get it, the woman correctly did not know what the student was talking about. Mm -hmm. And then finally she understood and she said, what do, you, what do you mean racism? Everyone in Uganda is black, right? There is, you know, there is no, you know. And, and then also when you, as a white person, show up in these places, nobody cares. It's sort of nice, right? A little, little, and I'm not saying that everything in the whole world is uncomplicated. And I probably come into places with a high degree of status, sometimes with a high degree of financial empowerment. But my experience in also in China, everywhere I've been, is that pretty quickly people size you up and treat you as a human being, right? Maybe if you're a horrible human being, people will treat you horribly, but most of the time people are going to treat you with respect and kindness, just like you would treat anyone who's reasonable with respect and kindness. If somebody shows up and is a serious, oddly unpleasant person making your life difficult, pretty quickly you'll give signals, hey, that's not cool, but that's I yeah. think the case everywhere. And yeah. I think there are exceptions, but let's just say in Tanzania, you can go around where you want. That's not dangerous. There are places that are dangerous in other parts of the world. And in the Middle East, I've spent a lot of time. I mean, let's say in, if I'm in Tehran, I stand out like a sore thumb, right? If I'm walking from the Peace Square down the, the hill past the soda factory. I, I, I'm like a head taller than everybody, but nobody even looks at me or talk, you know, talks to me. I'm just there. And and then if you engage with people, then you you engage and talk about stuff. But also, I think there's a tendency to forget that we are talking about places with an incredibly rich history and past, right? Yeah. You're not going to talk to someone in Iran who somehow feels like they're second class citizens. On the contrary, they'll say, wow, you know, our kingdoms and empires were so vastly ahead of Europe, let, you know, let alone the, 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 everywhere in the world, right? If you go to Persepolis or places like that, nobody is going to feel as a person that you're somehow from a disadvantaged background. And Syria is one of the most cosmopolitan places in the world, right? With all the different influences and I think if you don't know about these things, you might say, oh, it's just, you know, I don't know, it's just serious. I mean, who knows what's going on there? I don't, it's dangerous or bad or something yeah, like that. Well, the media just, you know, focuses on, you know, little snippets of this and that. And it's usually based on what the media considers to be newsworthy, yeah. which, you know, really has nothing to do with like understanding a place better or really knowing it or, well, in Syria, I know you said you uh, worked on Aleppo, right? The yeah. one of the main characteristics of the, of the Ba'ath Party, who are often Alawites, is religious tolerance, right? For a whole range of politically expedient reasons. But it's not like you go to Syria and there's religious intolerance. On the contrary, there's a great deal of religious tolerance. In Iran, obviously, those things play out a little differently and where you are matters. But these are places that have incredibly rich histories and uh, with incredible achievements that I'm, I'm the last one to be critical of North American, uh, the North American past. I've worked on it a lot or the European past, yeah, but let's yeah. just say at the time Persepolis was built, there was a very different kind of material culture in Europe or in North America. That's not a value judgment, but it's a fact that yeah. helps explain why persons would be so proud of their their culture, just like Egyptians are, correctly so. I yeah, think you I think yeah. you could be proud of any cultural background. Yeah, it's all it's all part of the package, you know. Like every every place has its points of pride and um yeah, so, but let's get back to your era, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're um, probably um, 
in like our school curriculum and the media, we hear more about Persepolis and things like that. But I'm just curious about like Paleolithic humans in the Middle East. I mean, what is what is that? What does that mean? Like what what was humanity like in the Middle East like a hundred thousand years ago? Yeah, that is in fact what I work on actively or most actively. And I think first one has to address research from the point of view, well, what what's the motivation for even looking at this? What's the whole game plan? What what's the point? Yeah. And what I do across pretty much the whole old world is to study the origins of modern humans. Where what are human beings? Where do we come from? How mm -hmm. did we get here? Mm -hmm. Why is there only one kind of human being today? modern humans, homo sapiens, whereas not very long ago, just 50,000 years ago, we had at least four kinds of human beings. We had you know, modern humans coming out of Africa. We had Neanderthals, Denisovans, Flores people uh, in the islands of Southeast Asia. And the unusual thing is the current situation, right? That modern humans spread out of Africa and more or less uh, colonized the rest of the world in a very short time. And I guess in an era where not, well, maybe in the US it's different, but at least where I live in Germany, most people are not looking to the answers to those questions in uh, in religious texts, <laughs> right? We have to deal with yes, scientific not arguments. Not mentioned in those about that era, yeah. Well, or the, although I do remember, I don't know if this is true, but I, I, I seem to recall when George W. Bush was president and was asked what, what he thought about human evolution, I think he said, or at least he said to have said, uh, the jury's still out on that, right? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, where, where is in, and, and I do think yeah. in, I do think that in the U.S. there, I definitely, when I was talking at UConn, I would have students come in and uh, tell me they had some problems when they went home and told about what they learned in school. Yes, in yeah. Germany, that, that is, is still a thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and in Germany, that thankfully, that's not such a big issue. I've never, I, I get a lot of correspondence with creationists and things like that, but that's always some sort of institutional political thing. It's very rare that I actually deal with a human being that takes that point of view. But in any case, my job is to figure out what human beings are, where we come from, what makes a human being the way we are, mm -hmm. what kind of evolutionary and social cultural processes created yeah. what we have now. Yeah. And I find it most interesting to work on a long diachronic scale in multiple regions so you can see the big picture. And I think that's a bit unique with my work. And if, from my point of view, why is it that the modern humans spread and colonize these other areas at the expense of Denisovans and Neanderthals and Flores people? Could have been the other way around. Could the Eurasian Neanderthals have colonized the rest of the world? And I think mm. they're pretty. I think there are a lot of arguments that suggest it was a pretty. I don't want to use conflict-based metaphors, but that that the, the Denisovans and modern humans and Neanderthals they were not that different, right? And as you probably know, or the listeners know, there was some interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals, modern humans and Denisovans. It was a, and it took a long time for the modern humans who originated from Africa to spread across the rest of the old world and later the new world. Mm -hmm. And, or just at the most basic level, right? Why would anyone have anything against Africans if we're all from Africa anyway, right? And in the, so I would say there's a, I would say there is a strong political aspect to my work that it, addresses the question that we are all mm -hmm. in it together. We're all people. We all have uh, the same origins. And there are a lot of unifying elements of humanity that make make it great, right? I mean, why? I don't, I think it's, I just see so many things that make human beings people who should be able to somehow, you know, coexist and live in a good way. And what are the forces that prevent us from doing that. And to answer those questions in the present and look to the future, a pretty essential point of view is, is a, a question is, well, where do we even come from? What is a human being? And again, you can't, there's only one place you can get that information. And that is from people like me, right? You can make up any kind of stories <laughs> you want, yeah. but if you want to know, you yeah. have to go like, to the source. Because you include the social context, because um, I'm new to this field, you know, I'm learning from you here and my impression, you know, is kind of like, basically like, okay, well, we found these, you know, fossils, you know, bones and d different records that we carbon dated. And 
So we've dated, you know, it's all about dating and not necessarily context at that time. And so, you know, it's interesting to think about it more holistically, like what is a human, not just based on like our biology, but on our culture. Yeah, I would like to think I do both of those things. And the most of what I publish is about the biology, but the, uh, excuse me, the culture, but occasionally I'm, you know, find human fossil remains that are published mainly from a biological perspective. The uh, I work a lot with material culture, but also dating paleo environments, and that that is the I, I admit I'm just totally biased, but I really do think that the kind of work that we do is so interesting. I mean, there are years where I would spend so much time working on the evolution of music and art, and other years I would look at you know paleo botany or you at music and art. We have the oldest music and art, musical instruments and art and evidence of religion in the world from my excavations. Of course I do. Wow. Wow. Tell me about that. Well, then, then we won't be Where in the Middle the East. <laughs> oh, okay. I want to know. I want to know. Where... <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Let's, let's, let's step back and we will get back to that. Okay. String instruments. Uh, the, or musical, uh, the musical instruments are clearly flutes. Uh, the, oh, okay. um, they're a lot, a lot of flutes. But let me, let's step back a minute. Okay. Okay. So. If we're looking at the question, what are human beings? Where do we come from? We have to go to the sources, which are the archeological sources are in the ground, right? You can make up any story you want, but who cares what, what you make evidence, up? Yeah. You need to prove yeah. it. And the only way you can prove that is with field work. And so I'm super proud of doing a lot of field work in a lot of parts of the world to try to see the big picture. And I'm in a privileged position where I had a good job at a very young age and was able to think long-term and not be in a resource starved environment and also be committed to make long-term investments in the places I work. And what one sees is that in general, I mean, there are some exceptions, but in general, when you look at the Paleolithic history of regions, they're different, right? It's not, it makes a difference if you're in East Africa or South Africa or Iran or Syria or Germany or France, China, things are very, very different as one would expect, as, at least as I would expect. And I admit I'm a bit anarchistic. I would not, I'm not interested in this schematic view of the past. I'm interested in a- well, I suppose the climate, the sure, terrain. Sure, of course. Of course. Um, probably because linguistic, I don't know. Do you look at languages too? Or? I would say in general, no, because we have no we records, yet, right? Or, the, we well, we do. We, we put it this way. We, there, if you, we have written languages that are documented a few thousand years ago, mm -hmm. but once you get back beyond that, unless you want to go into neuroscience, which I let for, it's, it's somehow in the mix of things one can look at. But if you want to have real empirical data from the past, okay, you can do a little bit with human fossils, but if we want to talk about symbolic communication, planning depth, displacement, that you could talk about the here and now, the past, the future. It's I hard think, to pinpoint the language because it's hard to find the evidence. Well, I can find evidence for that. Okay. I can find evidence for communication and about talking about the past, future, present, but I can't find valid information on how you said mama yesterday or uh, give me the mammoth steak right those are things yeah. we don't know those yeah. details yeah. but we can prove that communication was taking place we don't always know what's gestural what's facial expressions what's verbal and yeah. and communication even when we're talking we yeah. get a lot of biological signals right you nod your head yeah. or give certain looks or yeah. frown or smile or whatever Apparently, if, if you look at communication um, ninety percent of the meaning is conveyed visually, like sure. especially for you know, I guess postmodern man, not modern, <laughs> postmodern humans. But like today, you know, yeah. one of our issues is that because now we're communicating without uh, seeing each other physically, mm -hmm. we're actually losing so much meaning. Oh, like, absolutely, an unbelievable! Like the emotional meaning, the um, the social, the trust building meaning. To go back to the other question, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I had to do some online teaching. I, I try to do live teaching, but there's no question. If I had a whole seminar with, let's say, 20 students, 
I would have my impressions from online, yeah. from spending a semester online with you. I meet them. I wouldn't even know who they were, and yeah. and sometimes say, "Wow, geez, I I didn't know you were like that." Yeah. And sometimes you're kind of reading, you're imagining exactly. There. You're extrapolating. You have yes. a, let's say if if it's true that ninety percent of the information is you know, something other than verbal. And let's say your cameras aren't that great. And let's say you got, you know, 30 postage stamp size people on your screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you actually meet someone oh, and, and your <laughs> impressions are totally different than, than yeah. before that I've experienced that. And I'm yeah. sure the students meet me in person and say, wow, I didn't, I, that he's different than I thought he would be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, um, really an issue, um, you know, in terms of relationship building, but it's not insurmountable, I don't think, but if you're not aware of it, I think it creates issues. Well, I think that the, I, I just think it's a, a much more superficial form of interaction. And I always try to avoid online job interviews and that kind of thing and to try to spend real time with people and get to know them, especially if it's whenever something, possible, yeah, yeah, whenever possible. And especially initially. Yeah. But even then, even, even then the, I have to deal with a lot of complicated things at many different levels. And I would always rather have a face to face unless it's just somebody where the chemistry is so terrible that, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just not going anywhere anyway. <laughs> yeah, I but that. I think that's, I think in my experience, that's a pretty small minority of people. Yeah. Most of the people, when you see them, you say, Hey, look, uh, this is what I think. This is what do you think? Where, where is there some middle ground here? And usually the answer is yes. Yeah. And usually the trust that you develop, you know, in every relationship, why do you think, I don't know, Putin and Biden and all these people still talk to each other? Because, and, yeah. and it might be on the phone, but nonetheless, yes. nonetheless. Uh, someone mentioned that the other day. Uh, you know, one of, maybe one of the contributing factors to to the wars today is because people haven't been talking in person. I like, think. Like heads of states, even. I think that. I think that can play a role, but if we talk about the future leader, the the, the former leader of the free world, Angela Merkel, she would yeah. always say, even no matter how different the points of view were and how conflicted the situation was, she'd always say, well, let's talk about it. And I think Barack Obama would do that. I remember he'd like, there'd be, yeah. I think in some of the, I don't know the details. I wasn't, I haven't lived in the States for a very long time, but I remember like, you know, police beating up people or killing people and they, or whatever there'd be issues say well come to the white house and we'll have a beer and talk about it right <laughs> i mean the yeah. that yeah. obviously the point is let's get these people with conflicts to sit down together and interact and that maybe not always but at least some of the times it helps clear the air and helps find a path and if you're in serious conflict let's say warfare global yeah. issues trade conflicts you know I think it can only help to to interact. Obviously, if you look at the history of... Well, let's go back to your field. I mean, so humans were, okay, communicating. We don't know exactly how, but they were building social bonds from yeah. the beginning, right? Well, I can, that's, well, that's what I study, right? <laughs> so we know the earth, well, first of all, we know that non-human primates made stone tools and wooden tools and use all sorts of materials. So the idea that only human beings have culture is that most people in my field and in biological areas would reject that. Okay. They'd say, okay. they'd say there's some differences that. between okay. human culture and non-human culture. Right. And, right. you know, well, we have, we like, have even like, I was reading about a pack of wolves in Yellowstone yeah. that they've been following and, you know, they really have a community. Like, well, sure, know, yeah, sure. And yeah. there, there's all kinds of things happening. And yeah. cultures, usually, there are lots of ways of defining it. But let's just say in a biological sense, evolutionary sense, it's about communicating knowledge and behavior and technology from one generation to another, right? You can't make a computer. I can't make a computer. You can't make an airplane. But yet we use them all the time, cars, everything. I mean, almost right. almost <laughs> nothing that we use on a daily basis, we could make ourselves. Right. And But we, as a society, we know how to do these things. And there's there are very big differences between packs of wolves and chimpanzees and yes. how people interact and use and communicate technology. And we're at a university, the Ohio State University, yes. where we have an enormous wealth of knowledge in all fields, right? It's yes. impressive. Yeah. And the and that is necessary to maintain the knowledge we have, to pass it on, 
decide what information is well, passed on, how it's passed on. Needs a trusted source, you know, an institution. Well, independent of trust, that just the physical handling of this kind of information yeah. is yeah. is okay. is yeah. uh, independent of what you're doing with it is a pretty big challenge. Yeah. And I would say in my field, we can study that and we can look at how complex the societies were and getting back to art and music and religion, the evidence we have for those kinds of cultural behaviors developing corresponds very closely with the spread of modern humans around the world, right? The earliest musical instruments, the earliest artworks. So tell me about this flute. I mean, like, how did you know it was a flute? Like, did it just look like a flute? Yeah, well, the first one was found at a site called a guy. We're we're now in southwestern Germany, but uh, okay. you asked twice, so I will get to it. So the first discovery was made in 1995 by Susanna Minzel and Joachim Hahn. They published two flutes made from um, from swan bones with three holes, and they were reconstructed. They could be played. There's a guy named uh, Fritz Seeberger who was very good. He's not dead, but he could play beautiful music on these flutes. Once you know that yeah. something exists, it's much easier to find. Then from my excavations at Geisenklöster, from Holofels, from Vogelherd, we found a number of flutes. We have uh, at least a dozen flutes. How old are they? 40,000 years old. And you can play any song you know you can play on these flutes. And of course, the, the flutes are made from um, swan bones, vulture bones, always the Halloween bones. Reeds? Not preserved. Reed, ah, Not preserved. But maybe they existed. Right. Well, the, the, that's, that's what we call possibilist archaeology, where yeah. we, everything's possible. Yeah, and I yeah. try to stick in stick with the empirical record but okay. so you have to distinguish I, between I, I'm, I'm making a, a an attempt to pull it back to the middle east because reed flutes you know it's an important cultural artifact sure sure yeah the the well let's stick with the yeah, the okay. for these early flutes so yeah. we have Three, at least three kinds of bone flutes, multiple kinds of flutes made of mammoth ivory, which are super complicated to make, and you can play all kinds of things. You typically find so them from the tusks of the mammoth. Exactly. Wow. And the, the carving them is a very different thing than making a flute from bird bones, but we find them over, over and over again. Now, if you ask me, what can I prove? I can prove that. I can prove the details of that, exactly how the flutes work, yeah. exactly what they look like, how big, etc., what tones you could play with them. Then if you ask me, what do I think? What I think is something different. I think, well, if you have all these flutes and you find multiple kinds of flutes in one cave where you're, where the groups were spending most of the entire winters and they're pitch black and you might think about, oh, well, maybe they probably had some light in there, right? So burning some fat or something. Then you think of mm -hmm. the shadows on the walls. And if you're playing the flute in a cave with unbelievable acoustics mm -hmm. and you happen to have art, which we can prove there were beautiful artworks from this time that we can get back to if you're interested in, then it, in my opinion, it's extremely likely if you have Michelangelo's, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have Shakespeare's and Goethe's and Virginia Woolf's and Jane Austen's in your group. We're talking about thousands of years. So they're in the cave. They've got the light. They've got shadows. They have music. And of course they have stories. Of course yeah. they have ways of communicating. And these are, this is from the earliest time when modern humans are expanding across the world. So my point would be it's by like 40. A salon. It's not just like a cave. It's like. It's life. It's everything yeah. you got going. And yeah. the, and so how I would look at it is if you went back 40,000 years ago, mm -hmm. it really wouldn't be a big deal, right? You'd okay. have to learn how to hunt reindeer, how to hunt horses, how to work hides, how to make fires, how to nap flint, how to do all these different things, how to make rope and twine. Yeah, and it, it would be the same as going out in the wilderness today. Like, to yeah, to, yeah, yeah, it might not be that much different if you're from Ashtabula and you go to Tokyo, you got to re regroup, right? My parents are from Ashtabula, so I, I, we. We're both from Ohio, so we had a little exchange before we started recording. Yeah, so if you, you know, right, if you're from some Ohio yeah. farm, you go to Tokyo or Beijing or Shanghai, it's a pretty big adjustment. And, uh, you know, the more rural you are prop, and the less technologically based you were, probably the easier it would be to deal with the Stone Age society. But the point is yeah. the people 40,000 years ago had all of our mental capabilities, all of our linguistic capabilities, Probably and, our emotional makeup. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there are lots of things are filtered through a whole range of cultural 
behaviors, different cultures express themselves differently and at a whole range of different levels, but basically they were like you and me. Yeah. Then I also studied the period going back to Neanderthals, Homo heidelbergensis, so let's say 500,000 years ago. And I can prove that the people living then were sophisticated, knew how to get a lot done, but the record of symbolic behavior is much more sparse, right? It, you still need symbolic behavior and communication to say, okay, I'm going to go hunting. We're as, as a group, we're going to do, let's say this like, like Sherney, we're going to go hunting and uh, kill horses. You need to plan mm -hmm. your technology. You need to, to know what you, for the, oh, absolutely. The, yeah, you have to yeah. make the tools you need to succeed. And of course, you're coming out of a tradition where somebody in the group's not doing it for the first time, right? There may be somebody yeah, who's yeah. doing has never done it before, but most of the people have done it before. Yeah. And that's true for everything you do. Somebody's telling you, well, this is how you do it, right? Communities of practice, they go back that far because Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, so my field's education and that's really still the best way we learn. Like it's not like in the classroom. <clears throat> I'm not knocking that because <clears throat> You know, you can have, make a great educational experience in the classroom, but um, you have somebody who's mastered something, and then you know that's at the center of the of the kind of the spiral, and then you have people who've never done it before, and that's at the outside, you know, outskirts of the spiral, and you slowly work your way in. <clears throat> Losing my voice, you slowly work your way into the center, just by observing, and then by trying it out, and then you know, uh, getting feedback. I mean, that's really the way we learn yeah i think for many many mm -hmm. things have a lot of crafts work like that flint napping making yeah. rugs and mats if yeah we, if you don't know how to do it you look and say well that's pretty good i wonder how you do that and you could you might be able to figure out some things but most people who are not geniuses will profit from having a piano teacher or a guitar teacher or a violin teacher or a flute teacher or somebody teaching you arabic rather than trying to figure it out yourself the I think that's completely clear. Yeah, yeah, that's core, and you can't, you can't, uh, you can't exclude that from the whole learning spectrum. In my opinion, you have to, you know, really maximize that as much as possible. You know, awesome. So we okay. So forty thousand years ago, um, pretty recognizable, you know, in terms of what people are doing. I could probably relate to people, but <clears throat> five hundred thousand years ago, it'd be pretty different. Yeah, I think even, even it depends, everything depends where you are, but I would say, let's just go to the Neanderthals, although we could go back earlier if you wanted. Mm -hmm. So when modern humans left Africa, traveled through the Middle East, eventually get to Europe, the, uh, it's super interesting to see where stuff turns up, right? So on my digs in Iran and Syria and everyone else's digs in those regions, we don't have figurative artworks, we don't have musical instruments. In fact, we don't have these things in Africa either, right? So the question is, well, why does so much of this stuff develop then or become visible mm -hmm. in Europe when the modern humans from Africa are somehow engaging with the Neanderthals and with the Denisovans? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of hypotheses, a lot of ways of looking at these things, but mm -hmm. some, some colleagues, and I think uh, there's some truth to this, that when two very similar organisms are in a, in biological co competition, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they're biologically similar. They have similar biological needs, which one's going to make it right. And in this conflicted situation where there's real competition, the, you know, niche exclusion principle would be if two organisms can't fill the same niche, only one's going to make it. Okay. And in this competitive environment, there were times in the past where Neanderthals had displaced modern humans. But at this time, starting about, depending on where you, what dates you take, around 50,000, 45,000, certainly by 40, a lot of this process had been completed. But in this run, modern humans displaced all the archaics, right? And that's super interesting. And that's when you find all these symbolic artifacts and a whole range of technological in innovations. Okay. And then the archaics go extinct with a little interbreeding, all you know, we probably have about two percent Neanderthal in us, and uh, and if you go very far east, you can get a few percent Denisovans, and so it's a very dynamic playing field, and that's the interesting thing. And but these people then who had our full range of symbolic capabilities, technological capabilities, 
very quickly spread across the globe. And that's what I study, where mm -hmm. that came from, what was happening before, what was happening after, and how that all developed. And, and the I also work throughout most of the Stone Age. I also work in the, in the Neolithic, asking the question, well, what okay. is the difference between societies that live from hunting and gathering and at what point does it become effective or what leads us to a situation where we produce our own food mm -hmm. and that's about i mean sometimes i you know, because i to get to the layers i'm working on i have to dig through all the old the younger stuff sometimes i do things in younger wow, periods yeah. but so to look at basically the big yeah. picture of yeah, human evolution that's what yeah. i'm interested in yeah and I'm very much a generalist, which I think yeah. in in the modern world is a bit exceptional because I think a lot yeah. of people are uncomfortable with that because just too much stuff. And I personally find it super interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because I mean, you get that big picture, and it's it's impactful, like in terms of like it it make it it doesn't have that problem that sometimes a really specialized research thread has that it's kind of like okay, but so what you know like that's the feeling of yeah. an outsider to the field and then yeah. it's not to say that it's not valuable it's just hard for someone outside of the field to see the meaning of it well i know what i noticed in tubing is there there's absolutely no question i don't i'm not sure whether it's like this at ohio state i'm sure at ohio state probably sports is about 80 percent of the media coverage but <laughs> if if you look at the remaining 20 percent, what that is i don't know i mean sometimes you read something about glaciology or whatever yeah, environments yeah. maybe a little archaeology now and then but most people are not capable of understanding cutting edge chemistry, physics, biology, because it's super complicated. And also that's very specialized in most respects. Sometimes with things like COVID, it becomes interesting to know exactly how an immune system works or things like that, or people with sicknesses right. are interested Some in. It's, it's got yeah. some importance. But yeah. in general, if yeah. you go to a chemist and say, what are you working on? Most of them, <laughs> mo the average person in Ohio and any place else, if they actually said what they're really doing. It's much better to go to them and say, let's talk about something in history we can both talk about because they're going to have insights you didn't have. Yeah, and, and, and there are gifted physicists, yes. physicists and chemists who can say, well, I'm working on this for the following reason and it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But in general, it's no, not it's like that. It's true. It's true. I mean, I think the best translators of science are the scientists usually themselves. They, they do amazing work. So I want to give full credit where credit's due, you know, but, but in terms of really having relevance to daily life, it, yeah. it takes some, it takes some work. Well, you turn on the television yeah. and you just see archeological show after archeological show. There's that there, the, 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 there's true. almost that's nothing true. else you'd find that's about yeah. science. <laughs> and, and I think that is also getting back to the fundamental question. What are we? Where do we come from? How do we understand yeah. the world around us? And I think that's true everywhere in the world, and that articulates with heritage. I think there are a lot of people in Ohio who don't even know. Of, I, I, I experience this all the time. I, I grew up in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Archaeology in Ohio is amazing, right? Yeah. The you know the Paleo Indians, the Archaic Fort periods, the, and, yeah, mm -hmm. and I and see the mound that is Adina, the Hopewell, and the sophistication and beauty of of the. Really? Native American culture it's in Ohio, phenomenal. right? And most people don't know about it, don't even want to know about it. And because if you do know about it, then you have to think about, well, what about the people who used to live here? And did the path that this all take, how did that play out from their point of view? Right. And that right. becomes a far less a flattering uh, way of looking at the mirror. For, for the, the kind of um, nationalistic view, yes. Well, I mean, isn't how many, how often does Joe Biden say, well, we really have to do something for the Native Americans because we stole all their land and took everything they had and uh, exterminated large numbers of them. That is not a, a well, statement I've heard from Joe yeah, Biden. I don't think so, yeah. And I certainly didn't hear it from Trump. And uh, no. I don't want to be unfair to anyone, but I, I don't think that's a national priority. No. And I mean, even here at Ohio State, it's a land grant, but the land came from someone and sure. it, it was from native Americans. It was stolen of course. Like across the country, you know, to, to make, to generate the initial funds. So, you know, so I, I think it's all about, you know, um, having a healthy, um, kind of healthy self view that incorporates the full spectrum of, of, you know, um, the rights and the wrongs, you know, and, and, you know, uh, you have to start from that point of view. And it doesn't mean you 
can't accept a current, you know, the current state of, of things. But if you really are focused on a narrow nationalistic definition, then that's very unhealthy and quite abusive to people who are not <laughs> represented well, by it. You know? What's also profoundly ignorant. Yes. And ignorance is the greatest enemy of, yeah. of uh, moving forward. Yeah. I'm, so I'm staying in, uh, so I grew up in Dayton. I grew up, I grew up I was super interested in, in Native American history and the archaeology and all that goes hand in hand. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm you know, I, you, you said you were hiking at Clifton Court or someplace, yeah, right? And, and yeah. you know, Tecumseh was born around the corner from there. Yes. And all, yeah. all of those things are super interesting. And and then you can start, and that's where the historical record comes in. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to go deeper in time, then you're in archaeology. And I find that extremely interesting. And I think we're good at that. Ohio State and uh, Columbus has a lot going on in those areas. I think maybe one could do more, but nonetheless... There's you quite a do more, you know, because there's always um, the easy way out, which is to just go with, uh, you know, the kind of more whether it's nationalistic or it's like, you know, um, what do you call it? Like uh, Buckeye Fierce or something yeah. like that. You know, the patriotic, way, you know, way you're going to get more, you're going to be more popular, you know, but I think it's super important to um, to always to not give up to always you know work toward making things right that were you know from the past yeah well i mean also i mean come on the the okay i mean obviously these are complicated issues but mm -hmm. i mean your place like at ohio state or in ohio you know uh, jim thorpe and jesse owens all the great things these people did you know opened eyes at that time when the greatest athlete in the world was a native american playing his sports significantly in Ohio or Jesse Owens, you know, winning all those medals in front of the, uh, or setting four world uh, records in Ann Arbor in under an hour, right? Those are great things, right? And, uh, and I, so I'm, I don't know, I just think there's tends to be a, a, a worldview that is just very focused on the here and now, the mm -hmm. economic imperative, the, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, kind of a blunt instrument for looking at the world around us. And, yes. and I'm okay. Everybody agrees. You know, we want to have a reasonably high standard of living, but at some point destroying the environment has its costs. Right. And the, you know, the discourse needs to find some sort of sustainable level that respects the people around us and the yes. people we don't even know in other parts of the world. And acknowledges the need to change. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I, I'm an optimist. I think we can probably deal with the challenges we face. I know a lot of people don't think that, but I'm I'm optimistic. But of course we can. But I mean, we can't drive the, the the system it's into the easy. ground. Yeah, I mean, it's, obviously it's challenging, but I mean, let's use our creativity for that instead of for like the the latest weapon, you know. Yeah. Well, also, and that's why I study human evolution. Right? I need to look at the questions we face today. You know, I need to know where we're coming from. Also, you know, my professorship in treatment is called Early Prehistory and Quaternary Ecology. Quaternary Ecology is the ecological background of the last 2.4 million years. And if you look at the, well, so, okay, I grew up in Dayton, right? Moraine is just one you know, a few little step away, that's where the last glacial ended and deposited a moraine. Why is northern Ohio flat? Why are the Great Lakes there, right? It all has to do with... Yeah, but that's a little, you know, the orogenies and mountain buildings are a little that's different really issue. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's not, not entirely wrong. But the, yeah. but the point is, you could be in southern Ohio and only 20,000 years ago be under a giant ice sheet, right? I mean, that's pretty interesting. So yeah. it's not like the first time we've ever experienced environmental change. The difference is there's 7 billion people on the planet Earth, and quite a few of them live in low-lying areas that if the sea level goes up a meter, they're pretty big problems, yeah. right? And But it is not the case that the environment in the past was somehow static. The exact opposite is true, right? And the more you know about these things and how sea currents and all these other things, you know, plate tectonics, a million other things, air circulation, the, lots and lots of things, CO2 content, how all that stuff articulates with climate and present climate, past climate, future climate, those are really important matters and you have to engage with them.
Yeah. Yeah. And maybe learn from them. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So, I mean, how was it in the Middle East? Like, uh, I don't know, like in other eras, like how was the climate? Well, let me tell you about that. Where we work in the, the, in pretty much everywhere in the Fars province, Lam province, Kermanshaw, depending on where you are, there are places where we work studying early agricultural societies where even when I was there, there were still yearly harvests. There are places where there hasn't been a harvest for 10 years because it doesn't rain. Oh my God. But it really depends on where you are. Wow. I was just in Tanzania literally last week working on a project. And I was thinking, well, what's it, what's it like? How is global warming affecting everything? By the way, it, was, it isn't even that hot in Tanzania, <laughs> in the, depending on where you are and the details, but where... Southern hemisphere, so... Right. Well, it's equatorial. And the and there, the climatic change isn't so bad, but oh my God, in, in, in Iran, it is a huge issue, really huge issue. And uh, the, it's really important, the desperate need of rain, yet when you think that this is all being, you know, caused or somehow controlled by God, you know, that's not going to give you a, a good way of finding a solution, right? If you think it's in God's hands, then, uh, and it's obviously a problem significantly created by human beings. Right. Well, I mean, you can, you can pray, but that's not going to help you uh, solve the problem, right? <laughs> I mean, I have no objection to people praying all they want, but you have to understand what the actual causes of things are. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think, I mean, I think, I mean, of course there's science in Iran though, right? So it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. conflict with religion. That is a complicated question. I would <laughs> think in the Islamic Republic of Iran, God comes first. And and as I'm sure you know, working in the Middle East, right? If you're in, well, I mean, if you're in, uh, I don't know, uh, Morocco or Syria for Ramadan, it's very beautiful. Right? Oh, yeah. Because people are celebrating it. It's oh, like, yeah. like Christmas in Ohio or Tribune is beautiful. But I, mean, I guess, you know. But if you go to Iran. Then there's religion, yeah. Know? If you go to Iran and the government is telling you, okay, everybody, Ramadan, we got to get focused. A lot of people are not going to engage in religious practices when the government tells them to do it. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. And sometimes it's sort of like um, has the opposite effect. When it's, Absolutely. When it's compulsory. Absolutely. It, it's. Yeah. That is an empirical fact, yeah. right? Uh, the, I mean, again, it depends what circles you're in. I'm not, uh, there are exceptions to everything. Everything has to be contextualized. But there is no question that archaeology in Iran is significantly focused on very late time periods because that's where you have Islamic archaeology. And uh, of course, depends who you're talking to. And of course, the national museums have a much greater time depth. Of course, we can contribute to that. But it's not an extremely high national priority. Interestingly, if you're in Kenya or Tanzania or South Africa, I mean, in terms of climate, I mean, uh, I'm sure there are people working on like ecologists and environmental scientists and stuff that are addressing. And I, yeah, of course there are, but yeah. but the concerns about global warming, environmental change, have a very strong component of. Uh, of economics, right? If you're in a place where you don't know where you're going to get your food, your water, uh, how you're going to get medical care, you're not worrying about the emissions of your motor scooter or your car. You're worrying about getting food on the table, somehow getting shelter. And well, even in Ohio, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, farmers are a lot of times, um, uh, they're just trying to make a profit. You know what I mean? Like sure. they have to make ends meet every year. Like yeah. Yeah. And they may not want to take certain measures that may be better for the environment because they, they have to pay their bills. Too. Yeah. It's not chance that Greta is from Denmark, right? I mean, you know, they have a comfortable life and they are realizing, well, it's just, we should probably do a little more to help out around here. And, even even That's in the 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 the, uh, the the school kid from uh, oh, from uh, oh, right, yeah. something or other Berg that yeah. she uh, you know I'm just using her as an example but the the in Germany there's a very strong environmental movement which I totally support yes. but in Germany the you know a lot of the basic problems of food on the table shelter basic things are sorted out pretty well yeah. 
And then you start worrying about other things, right? Once you've got your food on your table and yeah. once your shelter is adequate, then you can start to think, well, okay, we better, you know, start worrying about what's happening in the global climate. Yeah. And no, I can't ignore economics on any of these. Questions. But if you're in a place where there are serious economic issues and uh, getting back to Iran, uh, there, you know, for a whole range of reasons, one can debate the, the sanctions, the nuclear policy, all of these things are very complex issues. I'm not talking about what the right political thing to do unless we go there in our conversation. Mm -hmm. But in any case, there are really fundamental questions that people are trying to sort out. And then whether there's litter on the roadside or, you know, everyone's conserving energy or burning efficient engines, that is not the primary. Yeah. I mean, unless it concern. impacts you, I mean, that's kind of the same everywhere. If you're directly impacted by pollution or drought or whatever, you'll protest it. You'll, you know, yeah. more, it's more likely, but if that's, I think that's one of the complicated things is like the people impacted aren't the ones making this decisions that made them impacted well let alone if you're so, if you're in a farm if you're a so farmer the ones who are making those bad choices it's not negatively impacting them it's downstream from them you know what i mean like that's the that's the well that's what they say about war right uh, send yeah. all every politician should first send their kids to war and yes. then we'll see if everyone else wants to send their kids to war but that credibility Although would even that sometimes still yeah, I'm very anti-war. So yeah, I know. Well, uh, but if there's going to be one, if everybody fights, I got a, I have a better feeling about it than if only the people who are desperate go fight. Yes. And the U.S. does have a tradition of that in some contexts, but uh, the rank and file of the military are often not the most affluent uh, people with the right. most economic opportunity. Right. But that is also a different question. But... Um, yeah, the, my point is the more we know about the past, what a human being is, the kinds of challenges we faced in the past, mm -hmm. how things played out in different parts of the world under different conditions, it, I, from my point of view, it's super interesting just in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I believe it helps us cont contextualize the problems we face today. And I would say it allows us to look at things in a more subtle way and try to make better decisions and you know contextualize what you know what's important or what's potentially important or it'd be pretty sad to live in a world where you had no idea where you came from or what our human history is like or what happened in the middle east or you know what's now the united states or Germany or wherever you happen to be, you, it's for, at least for me, mm -hmm. any place I've ever lived, I wanted to know, well, what was here in earlier times? And following that back into a time when there were no human beings and every step away along the way, I think that's super interesting. It's very interesting, yeah. And I mean, um, yeah, going back to Iran, I mean, are, have you found anything that's had an impact on like how uh i don't know on modern iran or on like history or i would say the simple answer to that question is no if you ask the question in academic circles the answer is unambiguously yes but i and it is true if you go to the museum in tehran or in shiraz you can see the results from our our uh, excavations on display and the finds from the warehouses that can be studied and there are a lot of publications on the matter i think there are uh, yeah all sorts of great results from our work whether but i think it's not so different than in the u.s right how many people are really engaged with the academics of archaeology uh, you might but we occasionally you'll turn on the tv and it is true the local people do care we do have local exhibits and it is true the television shows do you know that you know there are reporters who come and say, hey what are you guys doing and mm -hmm. um i usually let the persian colleagues do the interviews and stuff in fact always I mean, that, that, that is that first of all they want to do it and second i well i guess i don't even what's good is it going to be to interview me in in German or English, if I can't, if they, the audience can't understand it, and probably that might, in that particular context, raise some 
imperialist aspects that may not be uh, beneficial. The uh, but in any case, yeah, there the are, I have a lot of Iranian colleagues. Most of the team in Iran is Iranian. It's very rare that any, but he's not Iranian, and mm -hmm. the I think that there's a lot of empowerment there. And one before working Iran, or let's put it differently, I would never work in South Africa during apartheid, but after apartheid, I like to think, and I can talk to South Africans and get their opinion on it, that, well, after apartheid, maybe I can help a little bit. And I like to think some of the stuff we've done over the years has helped, some, again, since the 90s. And with Iran, Syria, Syria was a little different for a whole range of reasons we could discuss, but in Iran, I really did think about that quite a bit. Does it make sense to run projects in Iran? And, and what was for me an extremely important conversation, I'd actually decided I'm not going there. I mean, why, why would I go to Iran? I have so many other things to do. Mm -hmm. And I had a very close friend. He's now dead. He's an older colleague at uh, Cambridge, Peter Avery. And I was visiting Peter and a super interesting man, very renowned Persian scholar. And I said, Peter, I, I was thinking about going to Iran, but I pretty much decided I'm not going to do it because you know, it's a complicated political landscape and, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I don't know, some sort of scientific parasite in some area. I want to, if I'm there, I want to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And he had very persuasive arguments. He said, no, it is essential that you go there, right? Mm -hmm. And train and, you know, gener right. to train generations of students who were not getting trained in these mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. And I am mm -hmm. super proud of having trained People like Elham Gassidian, who had been a you know, teacher and who'd been working on archaeology, but actually, I, think, I think she's the first Iranian to ever get a degree in Paleolithic archaeology ever, and that it was a woman who was had oh, faced wow. some serious challenges. How did, you, how did you meet her? I met her husband at a meeting, and he also did a PhD with me. And then there are other people like uh, uh, Mosin Zaidi, and I've mm -hmm. trained a lot of people at the PhD level and have other links in the academic world. And what that means is that when priorities change and human evolution becomes a priority in Iran again, mm -hmm. there will be Iranians who will keep those fields going. And I think Peter Avery was correct, right? And the Iranians, it's self-determination. Look, they should run their country. I'm not gonna tell Iranians how to run their country. It's their business, but um, it's certainly, I think the kinds of work we do and the research we do is important in all parts of the world. And I think Peter Avery was right that having Iranians trained at a very high level on these questions is, is definitely going to be good for those fields. And at some point, those fields will grow. And there are certainly excellent Paleolithic archaeologists working in Iran. And the field, I would say, has developed quite a bit in recent, in the last couple decades and so i think it was the right move but those are super complicated issues it's not it's not as if yeah, it's not just the the artifacts you find or the big wins in the field it's the community you're building a community basically like a global community of people with different perspectives on the field and you know um yeah you're strengthening a global community actually that's how i look at it and, and so i do think that what i do has a real meaning in the political world of today. Yeah. But what I'm actually doing is studying the past and communicating that information and contextualizing that. And so I, I'm actually very committed to that. I think it's, again, one of the things I'm very proud of. That's definitely something to be proud of. Let's check the time. time is it? 1130 on my watch. 1130. So we should wrap up. Um, what are you working on right now? Is there any, is there a project or something you want to share with the audience? Well, let me think. The things that I am working on at this moment, I have a massively overdue paper on Iran about the origins of agriculture that I'm working on that I have to finish very, very soon or my colleagues in Copenhagen and uh, elsewhere will uh, get angry with me. Then I'm working on another paper about the origins of textiles and rope making and um, okay. from uh, Germany. And those are, let's say, the two most pressing things. And there's some other thing I need. Uh, there, there are a couple. I have a, I have a list of the, my to-do list. Can find, where can we find the paper on agriculture in Iran? Um, I can give you the PDF right now if you want. Oh, sure. Yeah. 
I, mean, I can give you uh, some of the PDFs. The one that I'm working on writing uh, doesn't exist yet in, in print, but I can give you some PDFs. Yeah, that's I can give you some PDFs about Iran. The words we uh, we also do a lot of work in the origins of agriculture in in uh, excuse me in uh, Syria. I'll make a little bibliography um, uh, and just include it on, yeah. on the post afterwards. And is there anything else you want to share with people? Like maybe how could they visit you? You have a museum, right? Like yeah, yeah. I'm I'm in the in fact. Um, uh, yeah, the, a couple different museums that the so if you wanted to visit our museums in Germany where we have the oldest art and musical instruments known you could um that sounds incredible it is incredible and it's really impressive and so you could come to Tübingen at the art museum you can visit me in my office room number 101 Tübingen is a little south of Stuttgart. So if you imagine you drive 2 hours to Munich, 2 hours to Frankfurt, 2 hours to Zurich, 2 hours to Strasbourg, we would be in the middle roughly speaking. And so you go to the castle in Tübingen, there's a museum, there's my office, you can knock on my door and say, hey, I, I heard you talk at the yeah. OSU Middle Eastern Center, and, and I'm in the neighborhood. I went, you can knock my office, I have time, I'd chat with you. And so you go to that, you go to the museum in, in Tübingen. Watching, so you go, maybe, you maybe could up. go to then our University Museum in Blaubeuren, and I've had quite a few OSU students dig with us over the years, so I'm sure Joy will probably uh, yeah. send a few other people our way. Yeah. So there we have a, a major, major museum. And then we have a third one uh, at the so-called Archaeopark at Vogelheit, one of the very famous sites. And I'm responsible for the scientific presentations at those three places. And yeah, definitely, definitely. They're, How exciting. No, it's, I do a lot of museum work, for sure. And so is this museum about music and art, or is it That's, more general? Let's say those are the high points, okay. right? Okay. The, and. Okay. The uh, yeah, so if you're, so I don't know who's listening maybe, to this, but if you're driving from making as well, <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah. all these things, yeah. right, 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 that the, the history That's of the human thing. beings. Yeah, you know, I went to a museum in Switzerland many years ago that was focused on the Celtic tribes. Mm -hmm. They were very; it was went way far back. Yeah. You know? Bronze Age or something like that. That's kind of that's kind of just recent history. That's that like has. recent history. But yeah, we that's what those are my people. But I tend to work in the older stuff. So we're, I think we're, we've got somebody who needs the room, so we better wrap it up. Thanks so much for those of you who are tuned in, and thanks to our um, audience that will tune in later to the recording. And thank you, Nick Connard. Thank you so much for coming to Ohio State and having this conversation with me. And uh, leaving um, a legacy with Peace to Understanding the Middle East podcast. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Melinda. It was a great pleasure. Who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll be back to talk about other things at a different time. But thanks for the invite. Yeah, I hope we can um, keep, you know, keep this conversation going. So I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. My mouse will work here. Okay. Bye, everybody.